Okay. Your turn. Let's go ahead and get started. It's been an hour. You get to be done and either catch a plane or go play. Um, I'm Chris Niederinghouse. I'm at Georgia State University. Um, I, I uh, twisted these other people's arms to come join us. And the idea today is to have a conversation about how do we pay for the technology training that many of us feel that we need to provide to our students. I don't know what your law school finances are like, but ours are tight. We don't have a ton of money to throw around for new big projects. And so I think that we have a selection of people at different stages and that have made different choices. Um, and hopefully that will be helpful. And just ask questions whenever you want to. It would be nice to have a conversation with people um, so <coughs> we can all learn from each other. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves as they come up, but Michael? Thank you, Chris. Thank you for letting me part be part of such a distinguished panel of <laughs> tall, long-talking, short-talking people. <laughs> um, <coughs> my name is uh, Michael Roback. I'm the, currently the director at the University of St. Thomas, Minnesota School of Law. Um, I came there not quite a year ago. I'm approaching my one-year anniversary. Before I was at uh, St. Thomas, I was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Law uh, for about five years, and that's where I started doing the technology thing in a, in a big way. I had a dean, Ellen Suny, who was very much a proponent of uh, having our students learn about technology in many of its different forms and flavors. And so one of the main opportunities that, were, that was presented to me was to uh, create a class with her and then another colleague, Tony Lapino, that we called Law, Technology, and Public Policy. And this class was really designed to be more than just um, a sort of a typical law school class. It was interdisciplinary for one thing. We recruited faculty from the School of Business, from uh, the School of uh, Architecture and Urban Planning, and from Computer Science and Engineering. And we also recruited students from those disciplines as well to create a class that focused on working with uh, Code for America, as well as the Kansas City Mayor's Office and the Chief Innovation Officer of the city. And what it led to was a variety of projects that were primarily in the civic tech area, but more importantly, as my uh, co-instructor Tony Lapino liked to say, uh, he was taught by a professor at Stanford who said the law oozes through everything. And so our take was that whatever we were trying to fix in terms of civic tech, there was some, probably some kind of municipal regulation or ordinance or statute or law associated with it, which might actually have been in the way. And in fact, we had one assistant city manager who was very much in favor of what he called uh, fixing the dead letter laws. So he was trying to be innovative and entrepreneurial. And so, for example, they were trying to build a pack, what is a, and everyone has this everywhere, but Kansas City, didn't have basically a restaurant and a packaged liquor store together because there were still ordinances in place from the days of prohibition that had not been ever changed or eliminated. And so it was a wonderful opportunity for me as a law librarian to do some guerrilla legal research and teaching uh, administrative and municipal law in a way that you don't typically get to do that. But what we found as we were going through all of this and working with the code and buying tools and doing things is that we realized we needed to be able to fund some of the stuff that we were doing. And so the dean uh, went to the curators, and the curators are in Missouri, the uh, Board of Governors for the, for the university system, and asked them to approve a tech fee, a modest tech fee, for each credit hour uh, for law students. So it was not a university-wide fee. It was not um, an additional fee that would have gone into the university funding mechanism. It was meant to be a law school fee. So uh, we calculated for some of the stuff we wanted to buy um, because we were also at that point engaged in trying to work with LTC4 uh, and figured out we needed about 10 grand to move forward with that operation. There were other things we were trying to, to figure out like uh, ExamSoft, we actually wrapped into this, Core Grammar, we wrapped into this. Anything that we could think of that was a technology thing the students were being nickeled and dimed for. Uh, we tried to figure out, well, what if they paid a modest fee? Could we cover the expenses on that? And so I think the, it was a dollar five maybe, or dollar ten, 
that worked out to be. And it generated not just sufficient funds to cover everything we want, but became an, an ongoing revenue stream for us to do technology things. In fact, it became kind of embarrassing because uh, it was so much money, we suddenly didn't know what to do with it exactly, uh, which I know is a good problem to have. Um, <clears throat> and so that, that helped, um, helped us be able to fund several of the initiatives that we wanted uh, to ta undertake uh, while, we were, while we were uh, developing the law, technology, and public policy class. Um, we had a couple of other classes on practice management, so uh, we were able to actually upgrade all the computers in our lab so that we could uh, install hot docs on all of them, so we could uh, begin a class in document assembly <laughs> software. Um, so that was, the, that was how we managed to get around that, because it, none of these things are inexpensive, even though uh, hot docs <clears throat> does have an academic <laughs> licensing. Um, I guess I'm curious, how many people have hot docs in their school or are using it? A couple? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's pricey. It's still the 800-pound gorilla when it comes to document assembly <coughs> software. Um, lets you teach basics. Integrates nicely with uh, Word, of course. So uh, there are a lot of reasons to use it. So now I've moved to the University of St. Thomas where I have nothing. Well, I don't mean nothing. I, I'm, uh, I am now rebuilding everything that, <clears throat> or I'm trying to rebuild everything that um, I had in Kansas <coughs> City, but perhaps with a slightly different flavor. So one of the things I've done is, um, one of the things we did in Kansas City that I've now replicated in Minneapolis is to start a chapter of legal hackers. Uh, there's the International Legal Hackers Group. Um, actually, many cities have a chapter. Many of the larger cities have a chapter. And it's actually kind of a low-cost way to find volunteers and help to work with technology and on technology projects. Um, and so what I'm really thinking about doing is taking some of my traditional library budget and convincing my dean that I should be shifting that to technology, um, technology stuff. This is tied to my trying to think through our collection development philosophy. And so for those of you who aren't librarians, uh, sorry for this digression into library speak. Uh, but um, I'm trying to get us to move from a just-in-case collection model to a just-in-time collection model, right? So what that means basically is that librarians forever have bought books because we think somebody's going to use it, so it sits on the shelf. Um, and it may be used, but it may be used more by interlibrary loan than by our own faculty. And so thinking through how we can change that model also makes me think that I can do something slightly better with the money I have uh, that has been typically allocated for print budget. Um, and so that's where I'm headed now. It's still a modest amount of money that I'm thinking about. I think actually, frankly, for what I want to try and accomplish in the next two years, I need about between twenty and $30,000, which is a lot of money. But when it comes to, relatively speaking, to the budget, I think it's something that I could um, <coughs> kind of pull out of it. And then I don't know that I'd ever be able to replicate the tech fee uh, that we, we were able to have at UMKC, but I will tell you if you can go back to your dean or go back to your administration and talk to them about that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reasonable and as I say, it doesn't, we were, we basically we took the position students are paying for this stuff themselves anyway. So let's figure a way to make it less expensive for them overall. <coughs> and so that was the point of that. So I think that, that covers my experience and the kinds of things I've been doing. I apologize because I'm uh, deathly afraid of missing my flight, so I'm leaving now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although if anyone has a question, I'm sure the panel will be able to cover it. <laughs> <laughs> but Elvis is leaving the room. Thank you all very much. <laughs> OK, Michael, I'm amazed that you were able to talk while seated. I don't think I'm genetically capable of that. <laughs> I have to stay in because I move and uh, gesture and, and whatnot. I am Carol Watson, University of Georgia Law Library Director. I was, uh, have been director close to eight years now, but I was previously the Associate Director for IT Services at the law school. Uh, so I come at this with a passion for technology um, even from the beginning. So um, 
Definitely, I think we all agree that we're in transition times, and I hope that we will look back on this and laugh, like, remember when we used to talk at Cali about student printing? <laughs> that we say, remember when we used to wonder how we were going to teach the student technology? And it will become a natural part of the curriculum instead, just like professionalism and ethics and other uh, and evidence and other major um, components of our curriculum. So we don't have a clear-cut answer at UGA uh, about who offers tech training and who pays for it. I would say that we are the nascent model um, in our description. We have a shared interest from library, faculty, and IT staff, and we have mixed funding sources from grants, library, and then we supplement the curriculum with adjunct faculty. I'm going to talk for a minute about Grant funding, Michael mentioned the student tech fee. We have a standard student tech fee at our university. We get a chunk of it, and it typically goes for classroom upgrades, but we can apply for special projects. We have applied for funding to equip the podcasting studio, which we have recently done. It's been very successful. Um, but I would say that the key to that success has been a marriage between uh, the library a passionate faculty member who has a regular ongoing podcast, and then uh, the IT folks as well. We equip the studio with you know, professional sound mixing <coughs> boards and um, wonderful microphones, and we can do distance ed in the class, in that room as well, and record uh, lectures and Skype and webinars and, and things. But the library, in addition to starting our own podcasting series, we manage the bookings for the room and we've been doing kind of promotion and trying to get students involved and interested in the room as well. So I feel like right now we all have to be in it together and we all have to work together with our different components. Um, the library does, as Michael said, fund a fair amount of the technology <coughs> support. We do, we fund Cali. We're looking at something like um, per service of the, or the Library Society Technology um, a credit, a little Cer certificate, thank you, certificate, I want to say accreditation, um, certificate model. Um, we um, are also split in the training that we offer. Uh, the library has offered, we started with the research and training technology skills for Georgia lawyers. We were thinking, well, we'll mix in a little research and we'll prep somebody to go out and be a solo practitioner. And that was pretty successful. In fact, it was so successful that we split it into two courses. And now we just do a Georgia research and we have the, over here the plain legal tech class and it's attracted people not just that are going into practice for themselves but that might be even doing public interest work or large firm work. And what we're doing now is the IT staff has become interested so now some of the IT staff is going to join us in teaching the legal tech class and so again it takes a, a village to pull all of this together. Um, for the future we are considering a personal technology boot camp is one option that we are contemplating and we are working on grant funding for some type of creative uh, emerging technologies lab. Um, so again we're going to go back to the grant funding uh, pool a little bit as well. Um, wish I could say I had a better offer for telling you how to fund your technology, but that's where we are right now at UGA. I'll let the other folks talk and then we can ask questions. Thanks. Well, hello everybody. My name is Darren Fox. Um, oops, I don't have the PowerPoint working right. There we go. I'm Darren Fox. I'm the Associate Dean and Director of the Law Library at the University of Oklahoma College of Law. And um, we've been very lucky at Oklahoma. Um, we've had great support from our dean, from alumni in terms of funding. I'm going to try to give you some, I'll give you a, a range of examples of things that we've funded, either from uh, grants from major donors, from library funds, from our library uh, and technology fees, on down to smaller things that you can do just straight up out of the library budget without having to do a whole lot of planning. So we have, um, we're attacking the idea of technology training from several different fronts. 
Um, and these are the three major components of our project that we call the Digital Initiative. And so we provide iPads with Apple Pencils and Zag uh, keyboard cases to the entire student body. We've been doing this for, uh, this will be our fifth year doing it. I'll explain the funding of that in a second. That's one facet. The other facet is we have a school-wide technology training requirement every year. The entire student body has to attend a modest number of technology training sessions every year that they're at the law school. Then we supplement that with curricular integrations. We go into 10 different courses in the law school throughout the year. And we do guest lectures on different technology aspects of civil pretrial, trial techniques, you know, 1L legal, legal research and writing, and the, the list goes on. That all kind of builds towards our students doing LTC4 certification. And, uh, and we, do just, we just started uh, offering a legal technology course that's being taught this summer. Uh, Kenton Bryce is um, our Director of Technology Innovation, and he teaches that with someone from the bar. And then we did uh, a major redesign of the library space with technology in mind, and we're doing a smaller lab redesign just out of library money um, this summer. So I'll show you some pictures of these things. Um, this is just kind of our mission statement. We want to graduate students that know how to practice in the digital environment. That's the point of our project. Um, so this, uh, this fall, we're rolling out iPad 6th Gen, the brand new ones that are cheaper, $399, mm -hmm. that work with the Apple Pencil and the Zag uh, keyboard case. The reason for the Apple Pencil is we want <coughs> students to get used to handwriting notes. Um, that they can then take that out into practice and take notes if they're with a client. Also, there's a growing, you can't hardly miss, can't hardly read the Chronicle every other month without there being a story on the front page about how handwritten notes create better uh, memory forming in terms of conceptual information than typing notes. So that when that became available, we immediately bought that. This is not cheap to do. Um, <coughs> And you can see just an example of using OneNote. So we train all the students to use OneNote. I'm sure many of you have Office 365. Hopefully, if not, your, your university is working on that. Um, available to the entire campus, and we do too. So we do a lot of training on the Office suite. Um, we have now six um, case books that are written by our faculty. And one of the elements why they got interested in writing their own case book was because they know that every student has an iPad available to them. So that's just one facet of the use of the iPad in the curriculum. Top Hat, if you, if you guys have never heard of Top Hat, it's a course management system. Uh, it's a, not a course, it's a classroom management piece of software um, where you can do polling and you can push slides out and you can do some other things. Um, so the fact that we have iPads in everybody's hand, um, the faculty know and we have just a small, just a handful that are, have embraced Top Hat and are using it in their class with the iPads. So how did we fund this? This is the expensive part initially up front here for the tablets. Um, we got a 100K per year grant from our university. So one thing to be thinking about is do you have university people who are looking to fund technology projects at your school? That's how we did this. We would never have been able to afford this just from law school funding. We got that for, for that and then Kind of an example of a smaller thing you could do just to get started in this realm is to, you could buy a set of iPads and go in and teach um, trial pad and transcript pad in your civil pretrial trial techniques type classes. That's about what it would cost, about seven grand for 16 six gen iPads uh, and then uh, 16 trial pad licenses. So that's an example of a smaller thing that you can kind of get your, get your feet wet with doing um, tech training or adding some value to an existing course. So on our, on our uh, annual technology um, training requirement, um, this is our, going to be, we just finished our fourth year of doing this. So we offered 75 lunchtime training sessions. It's basically three lunchtime training sessions per week the entire school year. And we do that through a combination of Kenton Bryce, our direct, director of technology innovation, me, a couple of the librarians, um, vendor, uh, guest lectures, um, that's, that's mostly what it is. Um, so we train on everything from, not just iPad. This is, really this project started out kind of with the iPads being central. And they've, that's kind of receded as one element of the project. Now the training is the central element of the digital initiative. 
And so um, I show the iPad apps here, but really what I mean is just you know, any of the software, doesn't matter what platform you're doing it on. So we train on research apps, case management systems, you know, trial presentation, cloud, uh, cloud storage, and collaboration. Um, anything you can imagine being used in a law firm, we probably offered a session on it um, last school year. Um, a lot of focus. It's not very sexy, but we do a lot of training on Office. Um, we have five different Microsoft Word uh, training sessions. Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, Part 4, Part 5. Um, so uh, a student can take up to five hours of Word training from us. We did three. We had 3,000 plus, almost 3,100 attendees at our training sessions last year. We have 500 students, so it averaged out to about six hours of training for the entire student body. Really, the curve looks different than that. It's 10% of the student body got 40 hours of training last year on technology from us, and half the class did the minimum. You know, three hours of technology training per year is the minimum. And then it's a curve that looks kind of just like that. Um, Michael mentioned this, but just so you know, LTC4 is, um, has been around for a few years now, and uh, they provide a list of competencies um, that you can use to um, inform your training um, on everything from Word. There's 10 different certifications that LTC4 offers. They only provide the competencies. So an Excel spreadsheet listing the tasks and features that you need to know. The actual software to conduct a certification is something else you have to get. And so there's something called Capensis that we use. Um, and that's the mechanism for actually testing the student. And then you upload the results to LTC4 and get the certification. Um, and then, of course, there's the training piece. So how are the students learning how to do these things? And that's where you have to look at your time in making these training videos, or if you have Linda or something like that that you can direct people to. Um, so that's one, that's, certification is one element, and we have an increasing number of students um, getting this onto their resumes. If you do something like this, you have to kind of work with your alumni base and make sure that they, when this appears on their resume that they know what it is. Um, so it takes a little bit of work in that regard. Here's a list of the certifications that LTC4 offers. Everything from security to presentations, time and billing. Legal documents is the one that we really hammer on because we want as many students to get certified in Word and Acrobat as possible. That's kind of what Casey Flaherty has spent the last five years um, talking about um, out there in the literature. So examples of curricular integrations, trial techniques. We teach trial pad to every trial techniques course, and they, the students use it in their course. Um, so that's what they're using to do their presentations. 1L legal writing, we do a required session where students come and learn the basics of how to deal with citation, you know, how to deal with references, how to deal with auto-generating table of contents, all that basic stuff. So that's a really good place to start that doesn't cost anything um, if you aren't doing much technology training is work with your writing people and get in front of the students uh, when they do their spring briefs. And then there's several other courses ranging from contract drafting, and uh, you can see there's, it's just a sample of some of the courses that we go into. A lot of case management um, system training uh, in a bunch of these courses. And then um, this is the Law Practice Technology course, so offered twice a year. This is where you, you really get the people who want to do the hands-on, really get their hands dirty. Um, so that's, that's the final element of training. So how do we fund this training stuff? It's mostly time. So we've made a commitment of having Kenton. Uh, he started out as um, our digital uh, resources librarian, and we actually pulled him, pulled away his librarian duties, and are dedicating him a hundred percent to technology training for the for the student body. Um, so that's the real cost in the training is getting the staff time to do it and to train yourself up on it. But most of the software you can get from the vendors, a lot of them you can get either at a reduced cost or for free. This is kind of a nice thing that students really appreciate. I do have about a $20,000 a year lunch budget to make this happen. So it's a lot of box lunches. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. What's the trading from Compensus in LTC4? 
request? Where does it? Oh, okay. So LTC4 membership is $1,500 a year. And then uh, Capensis, there's another one. Um, Tutor Pro, is that the name of it? Mm -hmm. Or Pro Tutor? I always get that's it part of my, That's part of my company. Oh, the okay. Pro. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, um, there, so those are the companies that, as you know, um, that do the testing platform. Oh, you want to know how much Capensis is? <laughs> well, we worked with them. It's just, yeah, what, it's how, about, it, how is it being paid? <laughs> how are the schools working that in? I mean, we're in about 74 schools, <laughs> and every school is funding it differently. And so it's just trying to figure out yeah. how is everybody doing it. Yeah. So I'm paying for it out of the library. Okay. And well, on your budget here, what, I mean, where does, is that part of your, your lunch incentive? Budget is that part of the training there? Uh huh. Okay. So most of what you're seeing here, except for the iPad grant, is all being paid for out of the library. So um, I've been a nerd. I started out as a computer services librarian. When I got this job um, and saw this wave kind of coming, I very deliberately just kind of managed the library budget in such a way that I could reserve funding to do these new initiatives. So that, that's how I personally made it happen. You could do it lots of different ways if you get the support of your dean, creating a budget just to do that kind of thing. But that's that's how we did it. <coughs> um, last thing I'll just tell you about is spaces. So the two things that uh, we've done in terms of spaces, we um, we redesigned part of our library space. I don't know if you all are experiencing this, but I've told my dean that essentially the entire library space is open for repurposing, reuse, um, for law school's future needs. And um, certainly we have to preserve space for students to study. The students, there's that old saying um, that the students think of the library as their office. And that's true. We want to maintain study space for the students. But essentially of my entire footprint, which is 52,000 square feet, um, a quarter of that is actual print collection that that just needs still needs to remain is not available online. The other three quarters of it can be repurposed for things like technology, collaborative technology spaces for the students, technology uh, innovation spaces, flipped classroom type spaces, um, those kinds of things. So we're thinking through what to do with this space um, as we go forward because the stacks just aren't needed. Um, so we, we, cre we got a grant uh, two years into the digital initiative to do this in as much collaborative learning center. And it's, it's um, you know, if we're going to give iPads to folks, if we're going to train them how to use Word, we're going to train them how to collaborate with cloud storage, things like that, we wanted them to have spaces to use it in. So we redesigned a quarter of the library to this space where you have study rooms that look like this, monitors, Apple TVs, everything is writable, the desks are writable, rolling whiteboards. Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see. We did actually keep a computer lab. I know people often think, should we maintain a computer lab or not? We did. It's heavily used. Um, we use thin clients. We use VMware. Um, that's what's running this lab. Um, we wanted to have this to be a supplemental training space, but also to uh, load software that's too expensive for us to buy. Um, for students to have on their own devices. So even aside from all that, just having a nice space with very adjustable dual monitors and really just honestly just that. Uh, we designed the desks so that uh, people could work in pairs easily with that sort of elliptical shape and it's used all the time. It's only 16 stations. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Can we get a little background on the grant? Yeah, so I'll tell you about the grant here in just one sec. Yeah, um, we created a flipped seminar room in here, and if you if you get ready to do flipped seminar rooms, I would encourage you to look at the active learning space literature and how much square footage is needed per room mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for flipped classrooms, because I way underestimated it. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, a room that was supposed to be a 20-person flipped classroom is now really a 12 to 16-person flipped classroom. Um, but there's four monitors which can be very easily switched and you can have groups working on it, the professor broadcasting to two of them, uh, movable furniture. Um, so that's used by about 10 different <coughs> courses that want to do a lot of group work. Um, we do VR. I won't go into too much about that. That's Kent and Bryce right there. Um, so he's 
busy exploring, and that's all paid for also out of the library, uh, how to use 360 degree video, how to use VR, how to use drone footage uh, to create course content. Um, that's what those, those pictures are about, and that's pictures of our two VR stations, which are really just fancy uh, implementations of Oculus Rift, really good PC, and some special software um, that just fits the design of the space. But the way, uh, we're also doing a smaller renovation <coughs> this summer that's just, again, paid out of the library. It's going to be about $40,000, and it's a bunch of these steel case Mediascape desks. Um, that will be open for students to use, just come into the room and use them, um, or classes can book them. So it'll be similar to a flipped classroom. So to do the InAsMuch CLC, we got a one uh, a one point five million dollar grant um, from a foundation in the Oakland that supports education. So one of the things you can do, I know this is hard to do, but look at uh, look at foundations that support education in your in your state and see if you can get someone interested. The way we made this happen is one of the people on the board is an OU Law grad. So that was our, our way to start the conversation. The lab that we're doing, which is just the old computer lab, will be about $40,000. And um, that's the cost of those uh, steel case um, units. They're about five grand each, um, plus the monitors and whatever switching stuff you would buy. Now I've gone over my time, so I'm going to stop right there and pass it on to Roger. Yep. All right. Um, I'm just going to talk about five or six things here um, for a couple of minutes. And what I'd like to do is um, get all of us to come up here to field questions because you all have different models that you've approached, and you guys have, I'm sure, questions about some of the things we've done. And I know that between um, the group of us, we also... Um, may differ in terms of some of the approaches that we've taken for some of these things. So one thing I'd like to say that um, sort of underlying all of this is how do we fund technology? Well, we're always doing what it is that we're, we're, we're sort of see as the core of this, which is providing resources to support the development of the pursuit of becoming a good law trained professional. We're buying, we've always bought books, we've always bought databases and things like that. So this is just an extension of that. So it's just trying to find a way to define what it is that we're investing in that isn't seen by those who are scrutinizing the ledgers as different, right? So it's not just, oh, well, this, you don't have enough money in your software budget. Well, this isn't my software budget. What this is, is this is the budget to enable better connection within our clinics to have empathy with clients. What happens that empathy is better to achieve if you walk up to somebody and you interview with a pencil and audio recording versus, you know, a laptop versus something like that. So it's finding a way to define it in a, in, in a manner that's compatible with um, uh, the funding sources that exist and, and doing that with a straight face. Um, so that's an example of, um, of one thing that we've done with that is we had, um, to um, one of Darren's points here, uh, a source for technology support, or actually a source for support within the, the um, university for um, engaging in clinical experience. So what we did is we turned that money then into a grant to get uh, iPads for all of our clinics. There's three reasons we did that. One is, again, to this empathy point, to find a way that we can kind of connect to more of the human side of things. The other thing is um, just efficiency. So we were using Clio for um, managing our clinics, and there's, there's an app for Clio, so we're doing it just to make it so that people are required to do all that. And then the third thing is the obvious one, is to give people the technology experience of working with that and getting, getting together with that. Um, an, an approach to what we've d chosen to do is try to get reusable assets. Um, one thing that, um, that um, Darren described for what they're doing with some of the iPads is that students get the iPad, so it makes sense that their model is then students get the apps. It may be like there's an app that's specific to a, a particular seminar or something like that. So you decide that's the cost of running the seminar. The downside is that cost is then out the door. Then you do the seminar again, you're going to have to do it again. One thing that we've been able to do, and this, this requires some technology infrastructure and support for this um, at, the, at the university level or your internal level, is that we do mobile device management. So we pay for the apps, we give them to the students, we say, this is yours for the semester for the clinic. It's loaded up with $500 worth of apps. You can use this the entire semester. 
they give everything back to us afterwards. And it's compatible with your own individual iTunes account. You can have that coexist with the things where there's apps that are managed. I can talk about that a little bit if you want. Um, the other thing that we're seeing in terms of, again, a little bit of this creative funding is that if, um, similar to what um, Darren is saying here, is that if what you're trying to do is, is, is train people, um, like why not say, why don't you spend your money on food and your food is then the, the vehicle by which you're giving that um, experience to people for uh, the training types of things. One example that we've done, and, and I know North Carolina has done this a little bit more extensively and I'm sure others have as well, is kind of uh, evolving our uh, prepare to practice curriculum so that our prepare to practice in the past has been typically secondary sources, primary sources, this is how you go, these are treatises and, and loose leaves and things like that. And instead saying, this is how you work with the technology tools that you're going to be working with um, in the summer, and this is how you become more efficient so that you focus on the knowledge work, you don't focus on um, the, the, the sort of mechanical work uh, for things like that. So that's a, another thing that I see um, for that. Um, uh, the third sort of uh, approach to this that we're, we're, we're working on to be a little bit more creative with is uh, looking at what are the existing <coughs> assets that we have that we can leverage in a way that's a little bit more creative. You know, lynda.com is often talked about, but I think with lynda.com what you'd want to do is consider two things. One is consider whether you, if you have a university that has a license to it, do you have the ability to actually create a course where you can oversee the achievement of, of, of what effort it goes into this, so you can actually track how much are people doing this. It's not a perfect platform for two reasons. One, it's not law specific, so that's a failing potentially, but be creative. The other one is that it doesn't track your actual accomplishments. Something like Coceritus is going to do something like that, but the great thing is if you're trying to figure out putting together enough material so that you know the ABA requires a certain number of hours for accomplishment to constitute a credit or a partial credit or something like that, the lynda.com things all tell you what those elements are. So leveraging that existing relationship in a very structured way to deliver as a component to a course or almost a course unto itself. Um, that's, that's another thing that, that we've seen to be um, successful <coughs> at. Uh, another thing that we're doing in terms of funding is that um, we have started working on, we're in the very early stages of um, a grant uh, that's uh, LSC funded to automate court forms in Virginia. And so what we're doing is we're taking that and what are we doing? We are paying students for this experience. So instead of collecting fees from them so that everybody gets this access, we're taking the money and we're then paying students. We don't have to worry about the pedagogical outcomes and you know formative assessment and all this stuff in the structure of a class, but we say, I will pay you to accomplish this task to prove, improve access to justice and you're going to get experience along the way. It's not going to scale well enough that we could get hundreds of people to do this, but for the coming semester we're probably going to have five or six people working on that and we're hoping that that will go uh, and get bigger. The other reason that that would be, I think, an attractive funding model is that even if you're not able to do something like an LSC funding thing, which has a lot of overhead and, and complexities, if you went to your foundations or things like that and says, hey, we would like to do access to justice and we would like to do something that then funds this. You could maybe start with paying the students and then go into paying for um, the time of the people delivering it after that. Um, the last two things I'll say is that um, just um, being creative, again, being creative around how we're doing this and how we're defining it, and being very honest and open as to what we're doing with um, the investment in things and trying to create something so the assets are reusable and so that we're doing something that's a little bit at a time and it eventually we look back and it's then scaled to a point that is um, really moving the needle on that. Um, I'll say one other thing just to think about and put out there for folks who are considering you know, new opportunities. There's a global legal hackathon in February next year. Anybody can sign up to be a host. Um, to Michael's point of like looking at civic tech pro um, problems and things like that, I think you could really make some good inroads in terms of figuring out what is your community like and what, what is something you could put together. You can have skepticism around what hackathons are or can do, but I think it's one way to just get out there and you know, put a stake in it and say, hey, this is something we could try to do and February's a little ways off, so you should have time to get that done. Those are all the points I had. Chris, it's you, and then let's yep. uh, chat with each other. Um, so I just have a few things um, that I was going to talk about. 
Uh, let me <coughs> close this. So, um, just a little background about me. I do not currently supervise IT, um, but I have in the past two jobs. I supervised law school IT. Like Darren, I started out as an electronic services librarian, so I've always had an interest in technology. Although, what's <coughs> interesting is five years into not supervising IT, I am aware of my waning knowledge sometimes. It's hard to keep up with things when it's not the major part of your job. But what I see, what I saw is students who don't know how to use Word, some of them can't even figure out how to put a page number on properly. Um, and when I teach advanced legal research, I, I do a class on ethics. Um, and over time, I've been adding more and more about technology in there with some research stuff still, but um, talking about in a previous session about, you know, people who don't redact a PDF properly and get in trouble and these kind of things and trying to teach <coughs> them a little bit. Um, our IT folks are not teaching any sessions, so the library, we do a we have a certificate program that a lot of your libraries probably have a similar um, program and we've started adding in a couple of technology classes to that certificate program so they at least have a place to get something. Um, and there's no one in my law school teaching a law practice management class or something like that. So I decided that someone should do it and since no one else was raising their hand, it's apparently going to be me. <laughs> um, and I don't, I, I don't actually feel like I should be doing this on my own. And um, I'm very lucky. The Georgia Bar has um, a, a department of the bar on law practice technology, and they have staff that go out and consult with firms and help people um, choose products and the woman who is director of that is just she's fantastic um, and she has agreed to co-teach the law practice technology class with me and we'll be doing that for the first time in the spring um, and then two of my librarians decided that they would offer a more practical um, legal technology competencies class for one credit. Um, and they're also going to start doing that for the first time in the spring. We're going to start with 15 students with the idea that I've talked about with my dean. But ultimately, we would like to be able to scale that up so that every student who comes through um, can at least get some base level of technology competency. The problem for us, it is time, but the librarians already teach in the first year. They teach a first year legal research class. Um, and that's what their teaching responsibility is supposed to be. Um, because they are fantastic. They're already teaching other classes like advanced legal research or Georgia legal research. And so adding on another class is, I, I am concerned about their time and their ability to tolerate the amount of time that it's taking along with the other stuff that we have to do. Um, I'm trying to convert a non-JD librarian position into a JD librarian position so that I can have that person teach and maybe relieve a little bit of that pressure. That costs money or state school. Um, Thankfully, my dean is a big believer that we need to be focusing on technology and AI and these kinds of things, and um, so we're going to go ahead and do that. But those are the things um, that are happening out of the library, because um, <coughs> essentially no one else is doing them. The other thing I wanted to talk about, though, um, is that the law school has partnered with Robinson College of Business um, to create this legal analytics lab. And it's 
an amazing opportunity for our students who participate in this. So they can, the, the, the first semester that it was rolled out, um, the students participated as sort of an externship. Going forward, starting in the fall, it's going to be a class, so they'll get class credit for it. And they're working, so the class is law students, business students, I'm fairly certain we have some folks from Georgia Tech up the street, and they're doing data analytics, and they're being hired by firms to do projects. Um, they're doing projects for others of our faculty um, to um, try to analyze giant batches of data. And um, encouraging the students to think about other directions that their legal career can take. Um, learning a lot about data science um, and analytics. And this, I think, is um, a really incredible project. But there are funding challenges um, to this as well, because um, it comes out of this Institute for Insight. So Georgia State University, um, if you all don't know, the undergraduate school has made amazing strides in undergraduate graduation rates. We actually now graduate students of color at a higher rate than white students, which is unheard of. Um, and they've made all this progress using data analytics. Um, so there was some funding to try some things and some funding from um, the School of Business. It was a big success. The faculty who were working on it actually had other classes that they were supposed to be teaching, so now we have to figure out how to keep it going. Um, but it's been such a huge success that I think between the university and the business school and the law school, we'll figure out how to make that happen. Um, so that's basically our tech and the issues. Like Darren, I've been taking some money out of my collection budget um, to try and pay for some of these things, but I actually two years ago took a one-third budget decrease, so I don't have a ton of room <laughs> to take things out of my budget. Um, but that's where I come from, and so why don't we do questions and conversation. I don't know if you guys want to come up here or do you have any thoughts, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, Ken Hirsch, I had a question for Darren specifically. So on your required training, um, I, I assume, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that faculty had to approve that as part of the curriculum. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. No. Oh, so how did you make it? Well, okay. Well, so, it, so what's the meaning of required? Exactly. So this is a, it's a it's a a, a dean enforced extracurricular requirement. Uh. Yeah. So we track it. There's a dashboard in which they they can look at and see what they've attended, and um, you know it's really that was really the idea of the of the three hours per year was really just to set a minimum. Just to raise all the boats a little bit, you know, knowing that then having 75 sessions, the, the boats that want to turn into speed boats or whatever better boat it is, would have that opportunity to do it. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, so as someone who's never done grant research, how do you start the process of finding funding sources and learning how to... Well, I'll say one thing and then I'll let you, because you have more experience. Um, <coughs> if your, your university probably has an um, institutional research department or something like that, and um, for us, they have helped the law folks um, find grants. And I've made an initial phone call to talk to them about trying to find grants similar to Darren's, but I'll let Darren talk about how they found grants. Yeah, it's, um, it's hard to do because there's, there's, there's political aspects to any grant proposal. Once you, once you get into asking for grants that are 
like 100k or more then it's probably from a donor that's on the main campus fundraisings radar and then you have to navigate the politics of who gets that who gets to make a proposal on campus to that particular foundation in any given year i had another project that we were trying to create a flipped classroom for 1L size classes and a, a partial redesign of the library to support our main courtroom with an event space right across from it that would also could also be used for breakouts and things and all kind all kinds of stuff and um, we were we had interest and then another another priority for that donor came up on campus and we we lost that so that's one piece of it but yes the main campus fundraising people there's main honestly the grant stuff in my experience, the grant stuff is not that hard to do. Most, a lot of the foundations that have money, they have very detailed instructions of what they want. So in this particular case, the foundation wanted a one-page one um, letter describing the project. That was phase one. If you made it past phase one, then there's all this other stuff that they want, and they pretty much tell you what they want. So, I mean, yeah, it's nice having uh, PR folks or grant writing folks to help you uh, customize that that description of the project and, and make it as good as possible. But the rest of it was kind of fill in the blanks. Well, I'm, go ahead. Let me, so I have done a grant for something else before, and the thing that sometimes I see people who don't do grants a lot, the trap they fall into is they forget that there are often requirements that they have to meet for the grant, and they forget about those, and then it gets a little sticky. Um, so for example, the project that I was doing, part of the um, part of the grant required that it be accessible to the public. Um, and so that took a little navigating based on our building and who was supposed to be allowed in the building and things like that. But Carol, you got a grant for something too. Um, we've had a couple of experiences with grants, and I would say one thing first. Look at your own institution to see what kinds of grants they offer. You'd be surprised if your own university, for example, had an initiative to encourage more engaged learning activities on campus. I could see a lot of the things we've talked about online for that. Um, the second thing is once you get a grant, you get more grants. It's a snowball. Grants, look at what else other grants you have funding. So, funding, so don't hesitate to um, get started on that. And then, um, the third thing is we do, we have someone in staff um, at the law school that advises us on grants and the thing they told us was to think of the project you want to do first, not looking at the grant, don't go out looking for grant sources, think of your project, what do you want to do, then try to find an appropriate funding source that will help you out with that, um, don't do it in reverse. <coughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. I just, I just have a comment. Um, there's another session, um, and a lot of people voice their concerns over students not knowing uh, Acrobat and Microsoft Office. And when and I thought about that when I went to my room. It's like, shouldn't that be like a prerequisite for actually getting into law school? Or maybe, you know, because I was like, you know, when I was in, in college, like, how, how could I not? I use those like almost every class, you know, it seems. But, you know, maybe for a course, it, um, heavy usage of Microsoft uh, Excel or something like that. So, um, until it's something that counts for comparing law schools and credentialing students for the entering class, <laughs> like unless, the, unless US News or the ADA counts it, no, it'll never happen. But on the same token, I think that you can easily introduce that as to some of what Darren has done and, and others is like introduce those modules as something where you it's part of something else that you're learning. So you have to have the, the piece of it to get to the delivery. So it's, it's the broccoli you hide in that delicious cheese casserole. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you're right. Having requiring those skills before you enter, no, LSAT, GPA, or whatever those credentials are, you're not going to be able to get the other piece of it and still get quality. Yeah, and I did have one other one other thought too. That uh, like uh, somebody was talking about like uh, needing iPads for for their clinic and stuff like that. 
Like our, our, our law college requires that every student has uh, a laptop, you know, before entering the college. Couldn't you also, like, make that a requirement for, like, say, you know, if you're a student that's entering clinic or something, that you're required to have an iPad or... Yeah. Can that just be a requirement? Well, we have a laptop requirement, but not an iPad. In fact, you can't use an iPad because it's not compatible with our exam software. But, but yeah, I guess that would, that would be one way to do it, is just to require that. I think she... So. I can make a quick comment to the... Microsoft Word, you can be really good at Word and not have a clue how it's used in a legal context. Right. Mm, exactly. And it's almost impossible to teach that until you're actually doing legal writing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. as qualified as I am in Microsoft Word and always have been as long as I've had access to it, that didn't mean I was prepared to teach other people how to do legal stuff until I really investigated it in the context of legal documents. So. That's the first thing I do when I walk into Word sessions, is I say, I know you've been using this since high school. I know you feel confident. It doesn't mean you're competent. And try to break down their understanding of how much they know, because that's the hardest thing, is to say, I think I know what I'm doing, but I have no idea what the deeper features are that are needed in this context. I can validate that, by the way. The first year we did our project, we invited some main campus people over, because there are other digital initiatives on our campus that started a year or two before us. And those more generalist type folks were not on, they were not on the same wavelength as the law students and the law faculty, even though they did work training on campus. The students ideally want to hear from somebody who's in the law school, who knows exactly what's relevant to them. That's, that's what they hope for. Yeah. Same thing with legal research and legal writing. They're not the same. Yes, sir. Um, not being um a lawyer or a librarian, I see some of this from a slightly different perspective. When we use the term um, legal technology in training, it seems a little fluid because a lot of times, from my end, my end of it, we have people who can't use these. If they don't know how to use a laptop, period, let alone Word. You know, and I find, you know, in my department, we spend a lot of time sitting down training these students literally just how to use their own computer. You know, so I, I think some of the higher level stuff we're talking about now, the, the terminology is fluid. It can mean a lot of things. And to people who can't even use them, you know, a couple of weekends ago, I um, had a conversation with my wife over the weekend. Well, people can't even use these things. Hey, my dad uses his. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to the swipe up, yeah. swipe left, you know, and then I've got a 15 year old buddy doing everything. I said, you know, I hate when you got to do swipe diagonally on it. And he said, you can't do swipe diagonally. I said, well, yes, you can. And I showed him a 45 degree swipe. And the kid was stunned. <laughs> so I, I will say, I've said the exact same thing to my dean when we talk about this. I said, my concern is that we actually need to start at a much lower level than we really want to. Um, but I, I, am, I ascribe to the belief that digital natives actual, I actually think they know less about technology. Mm -hmm. I'm old enough that I remember when I first started working that if a new version of the software came out, you had to go to a training class to learn how to use it. And now stuff comes out and people just start using it and they don't learn how to use all the features or to swipe diagonally or to do whatever because people just assume that they know how to do it. Um, when we start doing the technology classes as part of the certificate program, they may be the most attended classes that we do because what happens is, is the students who come learn all these tricks that help them do their briefs and their papers and everything and then they tell their friends and it kind of snowballs from there because once they realize that they act, there are actually things that can save them time then they start to understand but I, I agree with you wholeheartedly I, I think we actually have a much bigger problem than we're acknowledging so it's fine. We should let you all go.